advancing astrometric reference frames, although we have a new title here, the celestial reference frame, very relevant for astrometrists in the room. Okay, we can start. Yeah. One Ready? second, we're just making sure that the talk looks good in the room. Yeah. Can you speak a little closer to the microphone, Francois? Yes, I can. I'm trying the microphone. Can you hear me? I think that's good. We're good in the room here. Okay, great. Yeah. You've got control. Great. And you can see the screen. Okay. We can go? Yep, you're up. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Good, good morning, uh, people. We are in the room. Good afternoon for all the people over the world. We are following the presentation today. So you see the topic today, series of reference frame. Uh, nothing a priori which uh, uh, int uh, about exoplanets and like many of the other talk in which you have something like that in the title. But during the different talk you have heard that astrometry is a major uh, technique for exoplanet search or for uh, getting a very important parameter for interpreting observation like dynamical mass separation, distance, luminosity, everything like that, which actually come from astrometry. And at that level of accuracy, uh, you must be, care be very careful about what is a reference frame in which astrometry is done, how you define your direction. This is the topic of the talk today about this reference frame issue and why it matters so much for uh, the uh, exoplanet search. So I have essentially three parts, four parts, a reference frame for what, for whom, explaining some background about uh, what reference frame is, why it's difficult to define and to realize. And then the two variety we have today uh, in uh, you know, uh, kinematic reference frame, VLBR in radio wavelengths and the optical reference frame uh, produced by Gaia. And then something about the relationship between the two. We have two, how do they compare to, together? Okay, let's see. Why we need reference frame and at what time in a survey of astronomy people have, have been uh, worried about uh, reference frame and the meaning. So basically, what, what is needed for? Uh, I said for this uh, exoplanet search or for the catalog star of, of, of source like Gaia or VLBI, obviously you need to give coordinates just to point to define where the objects lie in the sky. So just basically reference frame is a coordinate system for which you need to define the pole or the fundamental plane, say the celestial equator approximately, and the origin of the coordinate, say the vernal point approximately. Again, the approximate word is very important here, but it is more important than just uh, helping pointing object and telling where they are. Uh, we need reference frame to uh, refer moving objects. So everything which is moving in solar system or outside solar system, you can see the motion essentially on the plane of the sky only if you have a good reference frame to compare position at different epoch. And different epoch could be a, num a large number of years. It's not only a matter of month of days. It could be 10 years, it could be 100 years if you use old plates, for example. For that, you need reference frame. You need to detect tiny motion, not only uh, uh, planets or, or asteroids, but just the motion of the star, which is very small, uh, so small that until 18th century, star were considered as fixed direction. And then had a show that probably not true. And that was proved uh, by observation during the 18th century. You need reference frame to quantify this motion very, very nicely in the splendor of the sky or along the line of seat with spectroscopy. You need that for more practical reason to track uh, 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 probes into inter interplanetary space. You need that to monitor the rotation of the Earth to define the time scale. So everybody, everybody needs that. To have GPS, you need a reference frame. To, to uh, guide a, a, a probe, you need a, a star sensor. We need reference frame. So all that is a practical uh, importance beyond the theoretical interest in that. So it is important for, for user or for people who are 
uh, approaching this uh, topic for the first time to be clear with the distinction between two words. One, it is a system. I mean, in practical, something you come come to you as ICRS, International Celestial Reference System. System is, is something very theoretical. It's all what you need to define your coordinate system because you have a lot of freedom for that. You have freedom to define the pole, freedom to define the length, the origin of coordinate, freedom to define what you call the longitude, the latitude, and so on. So this freedom must be restricted to specify fully the reference frame. And then uh, it could be more complex than that. If you take the old way of defining reference frame by using the ecliptic and the celestial equator and the vernal point as the origin, you need a full theory of precision mutation. Otherwise, you cannot relate the reference frame as it is one day as it was as reference epoch. So, so it's many, many conventions, many standard value for aberration, for parallax of the sun, anything like that, which is part of the definition. So system is what you have in your head. And you see, this is my reference frame. But practical astronomer uh, come to you and say, okay, now you have defined the frame, but how I can find the coordinate of my body, of my moving body, of my star? That you need a realization, some way to tell people when you do the measurement, this is the right ascension and the declination or the longitude, latitude of my source in these frames that has been realized a priori before I come to observe something. This is a realization. And the word which you choose for that is frame on ICRF, International Celestial Reference Frame. Those are two words refer to two different topics. One is theoretical, the other one is the practical. So Gaia and VLBI, uh, as it is today for reference frame, belongs clearly to this second part, realization. Frame is defined, it has been defined much earlier in the mid nineties. And then we tried to fit the realization so that they meet exactly the prescription describing the system. So ICRS, ICRF, the two. Gaia CRF and ICRFX are realization, independent realization with two different techniques of one ICRS. So let's see again the user point of view. If you are a user, you have your telescope, your refractor, something to observe, and then you observe a moving object, a new object, a new star, a supernovae, and you want to give its coordinate. So you get, you said, essentially, you have that. You have a coordinate, a grid on the sky. At least you have access to that. It means someone has realized this grid before you. And then you observe and you put your star source, the stellar source, your extra galactic source as one direction in this grid. But the grid is given beforehand. And then this allow you to give two number, one for the right assumption, or for the definition within this pre-existing grid. Now for people doing the reference frame, this is much different. They are observing fundamental object. In our case, Gaia and VLBI, this is quasar, extra galactic source, very distant, uh, no sizable motion and so on. And then we observe that in a consistent way it means essentially the feature you can see here is independent of any pre-existing frame. And from that, with convention, an origin, a plane, you create the grid after that. So this is not, this is completely different from the user point of view. This is what we do to allow the user to use a grid to record new position of fixed or moving object. So we are dealing here with a second aspect, which is the frame, uh, a consistent observation of a finish source, and then some convention to select the plane, to select the origin and the pole, which is the same as selecting the plane. Now I use the word right ascension declination in the actual way, because by continuity, we call the longitude in this plane, which is very close to the uh, uh, celestial plane, 
right ascension and the direction perpendicular declination. But as soon as you need a precision better than 100 milliarctagon, this right ascension and declination are different from what you have learned in textbook in, uh, at college level. I mean, the origin is not linked to the vernal equinox, and the plane here is not directly linked to the celestial equator. We have some formula to link them, but in the definition, in the realization at below 100 mass, they differ in concept, they differ completely in definition. On 100 mass, when you are in VLBI or in Gaia, it's about 1,000th time your single observation accuracy. So it is very different. It is important to get that in mind. So reference for Gaia. Uh, first, doing reference frame is part of the science objective of Gaia. This is something we have decided with Gaia to produce for the first time a uh, 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 CRF using the ICRS that it is defined with the extra galactic source, but realized in the visible wavelength, in the optical domain, while VLBI has produced realization in the radio domain. So that's a real science objective by itself. And then it's a technical requirement because Gaia will observe stars, planets, exoplanets, uh, whatever you want, ex extra galactic of each of them, we need a grid to refer them, and this grid is realized by observing extra energetic source. We have total freedom to do it, but the decision has been okay. We will adhere to the principle and the specification of the ICRS, and we will try to align the Gaia frame to the existing frame, in that case, the radio frame, so that we have a unique. Uh, two realization, but normally two exactly aligned reference frame. This is what we actually do with Gaia and VLBI uh, discussing together to get that. Just this is table, don't, don't look at that in detail, but if you take part of history first, reference frame as we are discussing it right now is not very ancient in astronomy. It does not go to Ptolemy and to to, to Tycho Brahe. They were doing star catalog and it was at the same time a reference frame. But starting in late 18th century, 19th century, there was a difference between survey catalog, trying to collect as much as possible stellar stores in a single catalog with position and small catalog called fundamental catalog, which are used, create to materialize the reference frame in the, me, in the sense I've been discussing today. So essentially in the past until Hipparchos, roughly, so until VLBI, so the late uh, end, end of the 20th century, the old system, FK5, FK, FK4, FK3, was using star, celestial quarter, equinox as defined by the intersection with the ecliptic at a certain epoch and dynamical system. In that sense, in this system, uh, the equation of motion of Newton should be satisfied, essentially. You have no Coriolis force, no centrifugal force if you use the original by center. This is the old system, ending with FK5 just before Hipparchus one. And then starting from 1998, at least the ICF one, we have extra galactic source, arbitrary fundamental plane, origin, uh, an origin and kinematically non-rotating system. The quasar uh, assume we have no global rotation and we fix the x direction, y direction, z direction in massified uh, way with the realization of the frame. So Gaia and ICRF radio belong to this part and now the other one is history. And as I said before, origin and plane are no longer tied to the celestial equator and to the vernal equinox, the true vernal equinox. This is independent of that. So we have key IU resolution for this uh, for this uh, frame that you define on rallies with uh, QSO starting in 1998, essentially redefining the ICRS, the prescription and the modeling. The modeling is purely relativistic for that and use the Barry Center of Solar System as origin 
on the x y direction uh, uh, materialized by the catalog itself. Starting from Jan January 1st, 1998, the ICRF radio superseded the old reference frame uh, materialized by FT5, the star dynamical frame. And then you have the ICF2, ICF3 radio adopted in 2018, and then 2021, ICRF definition has been reformulated to include Gaia CRF3 uh, to, uh, alongside the radio solution. I come to that at the end of the talk. So come to the two realization and their on this property of each other. Radio ICRF. So it is realized, as I say, by a VLBR observation in a coordinate way all over the world using the different stations, the different network, but using normally a single uh, way of processing, even so the additional processing used to, to validate or uh, to compare a solution. So most of VLBR in this work is not used for that. It's used for genetic purposes or for astrophysical purposes. So there are dedicated, dedicated session just uh, devoted for this astrometric observation on a specific program. Uh, up to now for the ICRF, uh, the solution number three, the solution adopted in, in uh, 2018 by IEU, there are about uh, 30 million observation. An observation is a time delay. Uh, you, you point a, a, a source and then you have a time delay between the two antenna that are pointing simultaneously in the same direction. Uh, this observation has been collected over 40 years. It means you can have time series to see whether the source are really astrometrically stable and then you can eliminate some source of time. Global treatment for set of sources which is not very large. It's a few thousand of them, so 4,000 in the case of ICF3. So, and then at the end, you have this, uh, okay, 4,600 source selected. Uh, within three bands now, there are three solutions. One in the, say, call it low frequency, medium frequency, large frequency. So 32 gigahertz, eight gigahertz here. So the more we go, uh, uh, the more stable normally is the solution. But the historical solution, uh, which cover 40 years is the SX solution. We contain the most source cycle. And within that, there are 300 defining source, which are the source used to actually materialize and ensure that the direction X, Y, Z are stable within the different solution. Normally, these directions are the same in ICF1, ICF2, ICF3. And it should be the same in Gaia CRF2, CRF3 as well, because we align the solution. So today, I would essentially speak of the ASIC solution, which is uh, the largest of the group. The other one are, uh, are done for the first time in ICF3. So you can see here uh, the distribution of the source. In red, this is the ASIC band that you can see here. I can remove that. Uh, in a square, green square, this is a K source. Although there are many, there are many in common. So you, sometimes you don't see that in detail because 80% of the source are common between the different wavelengths. And then in, in the uh, blue are the XKA band, which fill a little bit the uh, part of the southern uh, hemisphere, which are missing observation in the S6 band. So you see the essential is S6. And we are not a homogeneous distribution. While if you restrict to the defining source, the 310, 308, or 310, 303, uh, they are homogeneously scattered uh, all over uh, the uh, celestial sphere, more or less. This is more interesting to have that. So that's the defining source, which actually materializes the x, y, z direction. OK. And, and then this is uh, the only the ASIC uh, with the defining and the uh, uh, say ordinary or secondary source visible here, which is uh, the ASIC system with 4536 4, source. So let's see about the uh, positional uncertainty. 
a positional uncertainty is a positional uncertainty in the realization. It's not exactly the same as uh, what you would have in a survey catalog in which the position are given with alpha delta. This is here, uh, what matter is not the accuracy of individual source, is the accuracy of the final system. It's not least the individual position divided by the square root of the number of source, which give you the actual rigidity of the solution, how the X, Y, Z are actually materialized by this catalog. So you have the two kinds of source, the defining source in red, which are on the average much better because they have longer time, longer time of observation. Typically, the median is 40 micro arc second about here, and the uh, main core of the source where the median is 22, uh, 0 0.2 milliard second or 200 micro arc second there. And this is a rather extended tail over here because many sources have not been observed over 40 years, but of a much shorter period of time. So defining ordinary source and range of accuracy, floor accuracy, 40 micro second, normal accuracy for a, a random source, typically 0.2 milliard second. And here you have a plot showing the number of observation, number of delay over 40 years in the best case. So it could be, it could reach 100,000 for few sources. And uh, the accuracy as a function of this number of observation. It means the accuracy is essentially dependent on the number of observation. While for Gaia, the accuracy will be essentially dependent on the magnitude. Here it's number of observation which drive the final accuracy. You can see the defining source are over here. Essentially, they have been selected as defining source because they are better observed that the additional source has been gradually added to the ICF1, ICF2, and now ICF3. So you have this floor accuracy here, 40 microarcs second for the defining source on the menu. There are about 300 refining source or on uh, 4,300 non-defining source. So it's much more numerous. They are hidden here behind the red one, but I wanted to show where the defining source lie. So that's the main property of the radio solution. Now, realization of the visible domain, which is new, because it's the first time we have a realization of the ICRS in the visible domain with, with Gaia. So the paper is here. It's a paper that's been published in, in 2022 uh, with the main author, Sergei Fionel, and Tindegren, and myself, and then many other people of the Gaia collaboration, which describes the property of Gaia CF3. And there have been paper for CF1 and CRF2 a few years before. So it is based on 34 months of Gaia data compared to the 40 years uh, for the main, the largest, of, the best observed source in the radio from July 20, 2014, 27 to May 2017. So selected from external catalog. Gaia has a possibility, the capability for the future to make itself recognition of Queda. At the moment, this, uh, uh, Software this possibility is not good enough to select properly clean sample. It can select comprehensive sample, but not clean sample. So it's done by using external catalog for which Quasa has been identified by various algorithm. We have at the moment 1.6 million source uh, QSO AGN in the final selection. So it's a, a different world from radio, which is limited to 4,000 source. Astrometric filter, many filters are used to select the source. I don't go into detail, but essentially you say, a source must have a nearly zero parallax, not significant parallax. It must have a not significant promotion. And there are many other filters which are used to define that to ensure there are the minimum stellar contaminant in the selection. 
So we privilege cleanliness over completeness. Completeness is not important. We want to be almost sure that a, a source is actually an extragalactic source and not a star without parallax and with a proper motion. So cleanness and uh, impose a now watch window to avoid the contamination by star and detection as soon as, soon as possible, as best possible, of stellar contaminant, which is quite difficult to do. I don't enter in detail. And then we have the global astrometric solution from Gaia, which gives the precision I, I will show now. So this is a map showing this time not the individual point because there are two numerals, but a density map. And you can see on the right, the, the scale of the number of pair square degree, uh, giving you about on the average 50 uh, source per square degree but with something rather irregular, you see the signature, obvious signature of the galactic plane, a few sources inside the galactic plane, okay, are VLBI sources for which we have been able to be sure that are quite and they have been retained. In the future, obviously, we hope to increase the density and the coverage within the galactic plane, but it's very difficult because there are so many stars, it's difficult to recognize Quella. So you see there are some uh, uh, inhomogeneity as a function of galactic latitude, which is not real. This is an artifact of the selection, an artifact which was in the uh, 17 catalog, which has been used for the selection. Uh, normally, it should be much more uniform. It should be perfectly uniform in theory. So in theory, it should be improved, but OK. The dynamic is not so large, except for the zone around the galactic plane. It is not very strong. The factor 20, 40 percent on the between plus or minus. This is not very large heterogeneity, but it is. And then you have the Magellanic cloud, obviously, in which there are many stellar contaminants, so difficult to identify properly a clean sample around there. This is the magnitude distribution. So the average magnitude is close to 20. The median magnitude is close to 20. We go up to 21, uh, again, around the gate plane. But the average is clear. But again, this is not perfectly homogeneous. And uh, we opt to improve this systematic uh, heterogeneity we can see here. <clears throat> not better. Precision. As I say, the main factor of driving the precision is the magnitude. We are in the optical domain. So the uh, number of photon received, uh, the square root of the number of photon received determines the accuracy. So what you see here, at magnitude 20, you are about 0.5 milliard second. At magnitude 18, you have typically 100 mass slightly above that. And magnitude 17 is about 0.06, 60 micro arc second. And what is important is that below 0.1 milli arc second, there's still 32,000 source. So it's very large, very large. It's uh, about um, eight times uh, time larger than the, the uh, radio IC at the moment. And 0.2 mass is 200,000. So it depends very much of the magnitude. But in total, we have 1.6 million. But obviously, the system is also defined by the brighter source, and they are more or less uniformly distributed on the sky. So another way to see the same thing by a cumulative diagram. So it's it's range up to zero to one point six million uh, as a function of of the magnitude itself. Uh, for example, we have on the average one source per square degree giving a, uh, a median catalog of 90 micro hexagons accuracy uh, at that level, which is 18.1. And at 17.42, we have the number, round number, 10,000 source with a catalog of 60 micro hexagons for the median accuracy for source brighter than 17.42. It is quite many way of, of uh, dealing with reference frame then. So let's come uh, to the uh, relationship between the two. 
uh, we have done we have then two realizations that are important they are useful one in radios are useful for genetic purpose for rotation of the earth uh, it's there is no competition between the two it is a fact that we are happy lucky now to have two techniques which allow to realize a frame uh, meeting the prescription of icrs icrs does not define the technique it just using the state of the art technique we have at the moment. Until Gaia, there was no possibility of global astrometry in the sky providing a solution on quedar. Uh, Hipparchos has only one quedar in his list, uh, 3273. Uh, and Gaia has at the moment 1.6 million, but we know we will have four or five million at the end of the mission. So alignment, as I said before, the two frames are independent. And since we are not using the vernal equinox and the celestial equator as a basic definition of the frame, they are a great freedom. What has done VIBI? It has done its solution with ICRF1 and try to align the X, Y, Z so that this direction are as close as possible as the G2000 equinox on system plane. And the as close as possible mean within the error uh, of the definition and the error in the realization. It's just after that, we have been able to determine how far it is. We know the difference is several 10, not tens, several 10 milli arc seconds between G2000 and the origin and the fundamental plane of the ICRF radio and optical. For Gaia, the solution provides a perfectly consistent solution in a frame which is free to rotate. And again, we use some uh, additional constraint to align it at the best. And then when we have the solution, essentially this is what you see here. You have Gaia observation, QSO, blue star, star, uh, black star, and then you plot on the same plot the radio position of the star, which are the source, which are also observed by Gaia. So essentially, we have an offset between the two. And then we align, which means we try to correct one of the two, in that case, Gaia, to get it in agreement with the common source of the radio ICRM. This is alignment. This has no physical meaning. This is just a practical select decision to get X, Y, Z in radio and visible, theoretically identical. In practice, they differ a little bit, but theoretically, they are identical. And then we know the relationship to J2000 because of the study that has been done since the particles. So this is alignment. Uh, but now, uh, this is feasible, provide the common source seen in radio and seen in optical are really identical direction. If not, if there are systematic difference in a radio and optical, so this provides a limitation in the alignment and this cause also cause some distortion in the alignment. So the true accuracy in the alignment, which is normally uh, something depending on the Gaia accuracy, radio accuracy divided by the a square root of the number of source, it should be less than five microactum. But actually, we don't know how good this alignment is realized. It is done at the best it can be done, but we don't know for sure whether it is five microactum or 10 microactum. So essentially, the two are consistent, are aligned, but difficult to merge uh, direction from radio and direction from optical in a single set of, of source. So let's see in detail. Now I work only on the common source. Common source are the uh, 3142 source, which are in the ICRF radio and which have been also uh, seen in the visible by Gaia and belong to the Gaia CRF3. So this is about 0.2% of the Gaia CRF. But this is 70% of the 
of the BLBR series. So that this plot should not be interpreted in the same way. What is interesting here and almost surprising is that for this subset around May to 1920, the median uh, accuracy for Gaia is 0 0.19 in mass and the median accuracy in radio is 0 0.19. The two distributions are very similar. So it means essentially for this subset, uh, the comparison is, is almost perfect in that sense. None of the catalog is uh, uh, usually much better or much worse than the other one. So it's perfect for an early image. It's perfectly balanced. And then when we take now the defining source, obviously they are defined in radio. So they are very good in radio. While in Gaia, there is no much difference between the normal source and the uh, defining so defining radio. That's clear. So alignment is based on that. And now if we take the actual scatter plot showing delta alpha and delta delta in absolute way or in normalized way, meaning divided by the uh, combined sigma between uh, uh, radio and, uh, and optical, you see, uh, take, take the normalized, it's more interesting. The three sigma uh, area is over here. So you have about 80% of the uh, 4,000 source, which you have over here, but there are many outside, 20% about that. So these source are clearly, uh, uh, these this are this not random error. This is typically typical of radio optical offset. So there are physical effects here, which is, these source are incompatible between Gaia accuracy and uh, radio accuracy. There is a physical effect, and it is unlikely that in the future, with more radio observation, more optical observation from Gaia, this will improve. Probably it will uh, even degrade because the sigma will be better. So we will have a better definition of the center and so a better way to uh, distinguish optic to radio offset in the future. Okay, just to finish, uh, are you in the 21st, 31st General Assembly as uh, uh, reshaped, as I say before, the definition of ICRF, taking the fact that Gaia is producing an ICRF3, uh, and it has resolved that starting in January 22, 2022, the fundamental realization of the International Civil Reference System shall comprise the third realization of the International Civil Reference Frame for the radio domain and the Gaia CRFC in the optical domain. So we have reached at this level what people working in this field, Gaia and Reference Frame, have dreamt for since about for almost 20 years. Since the very beginning of Gaia, I've written slide explaining that it's okay. When we have Gaia frame, we will have to go to IAU and then redefine what is called ICRF to include both realization in both domain, wavelength domain. So I think that's, that's all for the presentation today. I hope you have uh, I've been able to share with you my excitement about this uh, uh, achievement we have done by now having a dual realization in the visible and in the radio. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me, Francois? Yes, I hear you. Yeah. Great. Uh, questions from the room? Well, I give you guys a second to think of a question, Francois. I think it's it. This is this is a room full of a lot of young, up and coming astronomers. Uh, you've given a talk on something very important about understanding astrometry. We have a lot of U.S. astrometrists or hopeful astrometrists in the room. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could also say a little bit of something to to the to the crowd on how important it is to understand the deep level on the reference frame okay. in order to execute all of the science that they're doing. Okay, thank you. Ooh, spare slides. 
I love when I can get to some of these spare slides. <laughs> okay, I will stop this set and I will go to the to see where there is some signal to Slack. Uh, so many signals on the screen, that's difficult to access. Okay, let's see in the Slack if there is something here. Okay, no, no question specifically in the Slack. What is the reason for the noise flow? About 40 microaxons for the PL2. Okay, uh, I think nobody knows exactly why it does this, uh, this flow. Uh, uh, they, when they validate the time series and the stability of source and the different solution, making different assumptions in the solution, they come to the conclusion there is a flow noise, which can be more or less compute in theory, but essentially by comparing different solutions done by different group, at Godard in Paris, I mean, I mean they say there is a flow noise that we cannot compress and cannot uh, decide whether there is something better than 40 microaxons. That, that, that's the reason for that. I mean, it's also systematic errors are not able to uh, disentangle at that level. Okay, Francois, we have another question in here um, from Chaz Beichman. Chaz, go ahead. Uh, so this is you know, just such a wonderful achievement. Um, Thank you. A question I had is often we will want to set up a local reference frame, a few degrees in size against which we might want to do uh, differential astrometry yeah. at yeah. much higher precision. Absolutely. What is your estimate of how you know, the rate at which that local frame will degrade over time due to unknown uncertainties in the proper motion and so on. And this, of course, will set up a need to reset the reference frame again with better proper motions. But what's sort okay. of the rate at which you think this would degrade? Okay. If, if, if you see the slide again, is it's a side visible? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't go to the uh, screenshot. Okay, this is a So your point is about the degradation with proper motion. The reference frame itself with extra galactic source will degrade very, very slowly. It is here. I mean, uh, over 100 years, it's it's few persons. So because we don't have to worry about proper motion. But what you say about the access to small field in small field, obviously, we will have few of this source. So you will trust the stellar field. I mean, the density will be done by the star. In that case, these plots here give you the degradation with style. So essentially, I plot that for two magnitudes, magnitude 15, magnitude 20, over plus or minus 100 years. And for two Ks, this mission as it is today, 34 months, what you have, and the mission that it will be at the end of Gaia, 10 years, okay, of observation. You see the text magnitude 15 in that case. Uh, no big change for the accuracy at the epoch, square root of time, very, very small improvement, but very big improvement because proper motion quality improved more rapidly than the square root of time. It improved like power three and a half time. So you see, after 100, year, 100 years in around 2100, it is still better than one mass. And back in the future, if you have archive, photographic plates, CCD frame, which have been kept, obviously you can use this frame with something better than one mass. If you go to my to 20, obviously it's not as good, but it is 10 milliards ago at the epoch of the Car du Ciel and 10 milliards ago in 2100. So the degradation exists, as you say, because of proper motion uncertainty, but it is much, much attenuated thanks to the 10 years observation we will have for Gaia. So that, that curve gives you the answer uh, to your question. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Francois. This is such an important topic. Um, uh, let's thank Francois one more time. Hopefully thank you. you hear the applause. Thank you to all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, and, uh, and we're okay, at I, I, free, I free the screen now. Huh?
Okay. Yes, okay. you're good. We can see your face. Okay. 